Hi, this is Brother Richard, and today we're continuing with our lesson series, Prototokos Mystery. This is part 239, and our topic today is when God speaks. What we're doing is we are reiterating a particular principle which is meant to give an understanding of a tremendous occurrence an unprecedented occurrence that's about to take place in human experience. And we are looking at the different aspects of this occurrence. Of course, what the occurrence is, the judgment of God that's going to fall on the human race and the ramifications that play out as a result of this judgment. And we find, if we pursue the scripture, many of the prophecies particularly the Old Testament prophecies, are giving us a different view from a different direction of the results of this particular event that take place that transcend <coughs> all other occurrences and the fallout from this particular occurrence. Scripture teaches a coming judgment unprecedented in the existence of man on earth will topple the human order and shake the earth to its foundations. Jeremiah 10.10 10. But the Lord is a true God. He's the living God and an everlasting King. At His wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide. The word abide here <clears throat> basically means to bear, to endure His indignation. Jeremiah 25, 31. Just before we move to 25, uh, Jeremiah 25, 31. Mm -hmm. Since this is written in Jeremiah 10, mm -hmm. people are going to look at this as being strictly YHVH. How do we prove that it's considerably more than a localized judgment? Well, <coughs> There's no judgments that been, have been gone that you read about in the scripture that shook the earth. Okay. Number one. Number two, the judgment that's described here deal with the nations, not just one nation. Okay. The judgments basically that are related in the Old Testament deal with either Israel the oppressed the nations around Israel. This is referring to a global situation, unprecedented. So we know it's not YHVH, we know it has to be a way. Okay. Jeremiah 25, verse 31. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy. Now the word controversy there in Hebrew comes from a word basically meaning grievance. And the grievance is with the nations, the nations, the human race as a whole in all its aspects, its tribes, culture, languages, everything that comprises it. <clears throat> Who has a grievance with? 
He will plead with all flesh. The word plead there basically means judge. He will give them that are wicked to the sword, saith the Lord. So, what we're looking at here, the word sword. Now, this word is used quite frequently in the scripture. And it has one of two connotations. In its literal sense, it comes from a word meaning a, a cutting implement, a knife or a dagger. <clears throat> In its overall, it's referring to judgment. Depending upon the context of the scripture, in many places it's referring to a judgment, not a literal cut, cutting implement or a weapon that has been <clears throat> applied. It's referring to the result of a judgment that's come upon the person. Having said that, turn to Ezekiel 32. Verses 17 to 20. came to pass also the twelfth year fifteenth day of the month the word of the Lord came unto me saying <clears throat> set a man wail for the multitude of Egypt and cast them down even her and the daughters of the famous nations unto the neither parts of the earth with them that go down to the pit here we have described a judgment. A judgment that results in many multitudes being cast down into the subterranean regions of the earth. Whom dost thou pass in beauty? Go down and be thou with the uncircumcised. They shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword. Draw her and all her multitudes. Now when, <clears throat> when one looks at this, one thinks that this is a result of a battle that takes place where these people are slain. But in the context, it's referring to the result of a judgment that came upon a particular group of individuals. So should we understand that specifically Egypt has a judgment put upon it? Or is Egypt merely one of the many nations who have the judgment put upon it? They're all uh, the result of a judgment. Okay. No, what, I'm, what I'm trying to establish is, since e e uh, Egypt is mentioned, mm -hmm. and we know that the leader of Egypt here is talking to a Lucifer in, in hell, is that a localized judgment on Egypt, or is that part of the same global judgment? Uh, it's part of the same global judgment. Okay. God has spoken, and this is a ramification of what falls out right. from that judgment. Because you notice, it's all in the past tense. Mm. It's not telling you that this particular group, Egypt, engaged in battle and was slain on the battlefield. It's giving you what transpired afterwards. It's giving a picture <coughs> of them being cast down to hell. It's not giving you a picture of the events that led up to them. <clears throat> it's giving you a description of the results of a particular thing. <clears throat> Verse 20, They shall fall in the midst of them that are slain by the sword. She is delivered to the sword. Draw her and all her multitudes. So basically, the scripture is giving you all of these people. <clears throat> now the unusual aspect of this is if it were war, then you would have the signs of battle. <clears throat> Bodies laying all over the place. Um, you would have mixtures. Because in a battle, you have hand-to-hand -hand combat. You have weaponry that's taking place. 
What you find here is a picture of individuals who have been thrown, the scripture says they've been cast down to hell in their nations. You have Asia, the Assyrians, you have Egypt, that's Egyptians, you have an, uh, Elam, uh, Iranians, all of them go to hell separated. They go to hell as a family unit. Mm. Now that's impossible to happen in a war. Because you're going to have close combat. You're going to have intermingling. You're going to have um, vitriolic hatred among individuals. But this shows that they went down as a group as a result of the sword. It's only one way that can happen, and that is they killed each other sure. off, number one. And the sword here is pictured as a judgment that caused that to right. take place. Yes. We know that the nations have continually gone down to the pit in a series, a continued series, since the fall of, of Lucifer. When we start seeing groups of ethnicities or tribes or nations going down together, is that a similar continuation of the um, nations going down to the pit, or is this something else we should look at? No, number one, never mentions nations going down. Okay. It says those that descend, so they go down as individuals mm -hmm. on a global scale. Okay. This is the first time you're talking about nations going down wholesale together. And it always talks about, like for instance, when Lucifer and his entourage fell, it says, with them that descend yes. into the pit. This is highly unusual because it connotes a directive that engulfed that particular group and sent them down as a judgment in a particular place. They go down and they're pinned. They're basically, it talks about them being laying in a particular position. Now, the inference is that some of them, if not all, of the groups went down physically. Because it talks about the group that went down with its weapons. You don't do that as a result of a battle. You read that here. Um, when you say physically, should we understand it to mean before they die, they actually they hit the pit before they're dead? No. Okay. It means that they got taken down live and died in the pits of hell. That's what I meant, okay. 26. There's Meshach, Tubal, and all the multitudes, her graves are round about her, all of them uncircumcised, slain by the sword, though they cause their terror in the land of the living. They shall not lie with the mighty that are fallen of the uncircumcised which are gone down to hell with their weapons of war. They don't even have a chance to battle. They're taken wholesale down with their equipment and everything else to the pit of hell. So this is a physical uh, judgment. The sword here is a judgment. It's not a result of a war. Right. Uh, these, these individuals are all armed to the teeth. But they do not get the opportunity to engage in battle. They are killed off before that happens. Mm -hmm. All of them have one thing in common. They are anti-Israel. Right. So we know this has to be a judgment. This is a result of the Elohim speaking. And if we see the beginning of the scripture it says, cast them down. He's speaking a directive to the prophet that's writing this to describe what he sees. His word is the sword that's come upon all these nations and taken them down to the subterranean regions. I believe that this is a takeoff of Jeremiah 25 verse 30. The Lord has roared from on high against the nations and on a global scale you're looking at one event of the judgment there are other scriptures that refer to other events of the same 
judgments, giving us a pluralistic picture of the result of what happens in Jeremiah 25, verse 30. Right. Matthew 24, verse 7. Remember what it says, the Lord has a controversy, a grievance against the nations. He's judging the nations. He's speaking a judgment upon all the nations of the human race that are the subject of the judgment. Matthew 24, 7. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Why does this take place? Because of the spoken judgment. His grievance is against the nations of the earth. And in that respect, the judgment that comes upon them causes them to respond in kind. This is the judgment cup. They go mad. They go against each other. They slaughter each other. Some slaughter within the nation. Some nations go against other nations. And then there are some whole kingdoms that are going to go against other kingdoms. The whole human race comes under this spoken judgment. Now, of course, we know that the The um, focus of this is Lucifer. Lucifer is going to be the agent in which this thing takes. He's the one who releases the demons. He's the one that brings the fourth empire out. He's the one that does all this stuff. But he does it as a result of being released by Elohim to do it. Yes. It rings familiar, Mr. Jones. However, we know the bigger war is Armageddon. This is World War III. Well, Armageddon is a part of the <coughs> Second Coming, which eclipses everything else that went before it. Right. This is the beginning of sorrows. This is the start. Okay, but it's nation against nation. It's, it's bigger than the other world wars. Certainly. That's why I call it World War Three. Well, World War Three connotes a human endeavor. I this, thought that's what this what we were talking about just no, now. No, this is divine. This is unprecedented. That's why when you go, matter of fact, look at the scripture here, Matthew 24. Verse 6. You usually have wars and rumors of wars. See that there be not trouble, for all these things must come to pass. So you have the Civil War, World War I, World War II, all man-centered. If you had a World War III, it would be man-centered. But he stops here. And he goes on. In verse 7, there is a departure from what took place before. What's a departure? It's taken out of the hands of man. And but again, it's God. nation against nation and kingdom of kingdoms. And these are humans? Yes, but it transcends war. We just read divine intervention. In a war, you're going to have a limited degree of destruction. The universe will wipe itself out. This transcends the physical, goes into the spiritual, which only God controls. This, this goes beyond just a body dying. This is a judgment that comes on the souls of them that are involved in all of this. Right. This is transcendental, unprecedented. Sure. Okay, yeah. And in that respect, that's why he gives us this departure. He's saying, now the change is taking place because I, Elohim, am entering into man's reality and I'm going to do some things. Right. Praise God. Praise yeah. His wonderful name because He's going to put a stop 
to this nonsense. See, I appreciate you race. explaining it the way you did because, see, when it involves men and it's it's a, it's a war like none other, so you think it's going to be World War III. But the thing with it is, is God is initiating it. So it's a whole, the, the complexity of the reasoning behind what's happening is completely different than the World War I or World War II. So I, I you know, with your explanation now, I have a better understanding of what's going on. So it's, it is literally a, uh, it's a war, but it's God behind the war. Exactly. Yes. Uh, it's a event that man could never experience <clears throat> apart from God stepping in and showing the depths of how far things can go. So the radical change takes place between verse 6 and verse 7. We're in verse 6 now. You've got wars. The human race is, the, the chess pieces are on the board. Russia's doing this, China's doing that, America's doing the other. You've got Israel entering into conflicts. Things are happening man-centered. There's going to come a point in which God's going to take over. That's where we step in. We're not interested in what we just talked about. That's the humans and their destiny. We go on, we go beyond that from the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows of the human race is the beginning of our liberation because God is going to use us uh, to bless his people. Scripture teaches shortly after this judgment on the wicked, the gospel will be preached worldwide for the righteous. Turn to Mark 13, verse 10. And this gospel must first be published among all nations. So the word published there comes from the same word meaning preached. There's no publishing that's going to take place at this time. So on verse 10, you have this gospel? Yes. Because it says in, in this one, and the gospel. Oh, excuse me. I stand corrected. This gospel is in Matthew. Um, 24 about verse 14. It says this gospel of the kingdom. This one here, yes, you're correct. It says the gospel. What should we understand from that? Uh, basically, it's the same it's the same connotation, but in Matthew 13 it's giving you more of an understanding that the gospel has never really been preached. <coughs> and in essence it hasn't. Notice it says must first be published among all, A-L-L, -L, all nations. So it means that nobody's going to be left out of the righteous to hear the gospel. Now, that, that um, <clears throat> leaves us with a problem. Scripture teaches, at this time there will be no natural way the gospel of the kingdom could be spread worldwide. Since normal travel will be impossible for men and the kingdoms of the world will have collapsed. The gospel has been preached up until this point through normal means. You have evangelists that are spread out from the time of the book of Acts, walking the roads, going to different places, spreading the gospel through proclamation to the world can't be done at this time that way. Turn to Isaiah 33, verse 7 to 9.
Behold, the valiant ones, the word valiant there means brave, shall cry without. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. Why? Because the world's kingdoms have collapsed. The governments are no longer viable. Verse 8. The highways lie waste. The wayfaring man ceaseth. He hath broken the covenant. He hath despised the cities. He regardeth no man. Talk about Satan. who destroyed everything. I was a broken man. You have no passage. Everything is now local. Everything is confined. The Luciferians are dominating the earth. The kingdoms have collapsed. The nations have collapsed. The human society is in disarray. It's reverted back to tribalism. You have no technology. You can't publish a comic book, let alone anything else. The only thing that can be done is at the most local, because men can't go beyond certain barriers. Having established that, Scripture teaches organized religion, which basically has been the, <clears throat> the method in which the gospel has been promulgated, will be totally incapacitated. 2 Thessalonians, 2nd chapter, verse 3. <clears throat> That no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except to come a falling away first, apostasy. And that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So organized religion is going to collapse. It won't have the word of God to even preach the gospel if it wanted to. Because it won't understand. It will be so corrupted through the apostasy it cannot pass on the truth of the gospel. So the ability to spread the gospel is no longer in the hands of the human race. No longer earth-centered. Jeremiah 25, verse 34 to 35. Howl, ye shepherds, and cry. Wallow yourselves in the ashes, ye principal of the flock. For the days of your slaughter and of your dispersions are accomplished, and you shall fall like a pleasant vessel. And the shepherd shall have no way to flee, nor the principal of the flock to escape. Drop down to Jeremiah 23, verse 2. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people, you have scattered my flock, driven them away, and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. All the religious leaders are in judgment. So there's no way that the human race, as it's currently constituted, can promulgate the gospel on earth. It's all been corrupted, taken away by Satan. Now, Scripture indicates the gospel will be proclaimed from the heavens, not the earth. Revelation 22, verses 8 to 9. And I, John, saw these things and heard them. The 
When I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which showed me these things, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren the prophets and of them which keep the sayings of this book. I want you to focus on the last point. Them which keep the sayings of this book. What book? The book of Revelation. The eternal book of Revelation in which John sees all the things of the Revelation. Angels is custodian over that. He's the one that's going to proclaim, pro proclaim the gospel to all on earth. So he's the star over the churches? No. No. The star over the churches haven't come into being yet. The gospel goes forth. They have to gather the elders to the point in which they get their inheritance. Then they become the stars over the churches. This is at the beginning. So at the point when you were referring to the gospel being um, promulgated from the heavens, where are we hearing from? Here. Yeah, this, this guy here that showed John. Before the, before, before the, uh, the stars come about. Yes. Yes. Remember, the custodians on earth, the teachers, are going to be the ones, after everybody hears, that explain what they have heard. We're going to see that in Scripture as we go along. But it's the angel that proclaims it. Notice what it goes on to say. Scripture teaches, when this angel saint proclaims the gospel of the kingdom, Anyone hearing it and distorting it, human or Luciferian, will suffer the judgments written in the book of Revelation in heaven. Revelation 22, 18 and 19. Notice what it said in 16. I have sent mine angel to testify of these things in the churches. So he's the individual, he's a spokesman that's going to testify of the gospel of the kingdom of the heavens to the human race on the earth. Verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto those things God will then unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. They have never heard the prophecy of this book. They hear the prophecies from this book. He's talking about the eternal revelation God the Father gave to the Son, gave to this angel and that group that are custodians to ultimately give to John and then give to the whole human race. Yes, Mr. Smith. Which one of us is, the, is his angel? Which one of us? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think any of us because his counterpart was on the earth at John's time. His counterpart has gone on from then. So he represents somebody that was from the Apostles' time. But he has associates that have been incarnated at that time on Earth now. Associates, I like it. Yes, let's go on. Scripture indicates the Lord will bring from obscurity, a global group prepared from eternity to give those who will hear the gospel understanding right, and okay. direction. This group will be gifted with godly wisdom. Turn to Daniel, the 12th chapter, verse 8 to 10. <clears throat> And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O oh my Lord, what 
should be the end of these things. He said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed. I'm going to repeat that. Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. They were not for the people of Daniel's time. No, they will be for the people who will be about the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. And, some, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise, who these sealed up words are for, shall understand. That's who they were promulgated for. The wise that are going to be on earth when the XY axis crosses. <clears throat> Matthew 24, verse 45 to 46. Who is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household in eternity, to give them meat in due season at the time of the great judgment on earth, when the gospel is preached? Blessed is that servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. So basically, what he's saying here is that group of teachers that are currently in obscurity, which will come out of obscurity at the time of the beginning of sorrows, will be the teachers of men that hear the gospel and are proceeding toward the gathering. As they go, they're going to be fed. What are they going to be fed? Revelation knowledge about what the gospel is. Remember, you're not going to have any book with words. Everything is going to be in the repository of the wise individual who has understood and received and now he's open to give what he has been stored up with. Note what he goes on to say, verse 47. Verily, I say unto you, he shall make him ruler over all. A-L-L, -L, all his goods. Now we're going to close with this. Scripture teaches this group will be given ultimate authority to be instructors over the entire creation because, why? Of its wisdom. Turn back to Daniel 12, verse 3. Daniel 12, verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. They're going to have a glory that rivals the great island galaxies that you see through a telescope. And they that turn many to righteousness, soul winners, as the stars forever and ever. They're going to have a glory, but it's not going to be a glory that will be matched with the glory of the wise. Yes. Soul winner. Mm -hmm. So a soul winner is as good as a uh, Prototokos member, or not necessarily so? Well, a Prototokos could be a soul winner. You're going to have within the Prototokos family degrees of ability. The, the point I'm trying to get to is I know somebody that proclaims his soul winning capabilities, but he is... He has a basket of fruit that all stink. You know, his fruit is rotten. So uh, I'm questioning as to what can he expect his uh, reward to be. Well, there'll be a test. 
the people that he claims to be soul winners had all better be with him in eternity, otherwise it's not going to count. Hmm. In addition to being a soul winner, these people are also discipling those that they lead to Christ. That's the litmus test. Okay, so you can be a soul winner, but you don't complete the, the assignment, so you you're don't not get a soul credit. winner. Yeah, you don't get credit. Okay. You can say, I led this person to Christ, I led that person to Christ. Yeah, but what happened? You lead somebody to Christ, you're responsible for that person. Yeah. Uh, people don't, you know, they go off half cocked. They think, well, you know, County Nichols noses, as certain people say, I got this matter, this many people to the Lord. Well, the Lord is looking at you taking responsibility for that person you led to the Lord. Mm -hmm. You look at Paul. Paul established a church. Paul lived with that church he established. Paul knew each and every one of those souls. And he did everything he could to develop every soul that was brought to him. And matter of fact, he writes about that. He says, you are my crown of rejoicing. I'm expecting to see you. You're going to stand with me in eternity. The people that complain, that consider themselves soul winners today don't remember the people they led to the Lord, let alone have they made any attempt to see how they developed. Yeah. So that's coming back to the point at which the word is being taught from the heavens. That's what's sticking in my mind right now. Okay. At the point that there are no more Bibles, Bibles, and I'm guessing this is going to be somewhere around, well it has to be before the Green of Sorrows, doesn't it? The gospel? No more Bibles being available. Oh, yeah. It has to be before the beginning of sorrows. I would say before the beginning of sorrows, what you're going to have <clears throat> at the onset of the destruction of human civilization, you're going to have no more access to Bibles. Mm. Prior to that, yes. So, a place, if you look for, you're going to have access to your Bible. Right, but from the point that, as you just said, just before the beginning of Sorrows, there will be no more access to the Bible. Yes, because you're going to have the destruction of the outlets that would <coughs> enable the Bible to survive. How far from that point to the whole gospel being uh, preached around and published around the world? Sure, a period of time. Months? Years? Months. So in that Maybe period, weeks. You know, it, it, so in, it's in that happened. period of time, that there is no gospel that anyone could hear, because it's in the hearts of men at that point, isn't it? Yeah, because you got the fourth empire rising. Yeah. You got Luciferian influence blocking out everything. The only word, the only thing that remains of the gospel is in the minds of those who heard it sometime before. Okay. There's going to be so much radical changes taking place across the board that <clears throat> people really unless you're totally committed you're not you're not going to have an understanding of what's coming down the pike and so you know it's just going to be an effort and futility for the individual but by that stage no one's going to be interested in learning something which they haven't yet heard. Because it's all over. Yeah. The doors are closed. They're going to be caught up in trying to survive. Yeah. Mr. Jones, give me a definition of a committed Christian. Somebody that <clears throat> has a first love relationship for his Lord and Savior. Of what Paul writes about, I would suspect that the angel that John talked about could have been a counterpart of somebody like Apollos. Should we look at this as all counterparts that ever were and ever would be already exist there and they're all around, all around the throne right now? Sure. And only the earthly counterparts manifest a given period of time because they're not in time, so sure. they must all be there. Sure. So when he says, which one of us uh, is it, that specific fellow servant that we see in 22, uh, Revelation 22, 8 to 9, has his counterpart alive at the time of uh, uh, John. Yeah. But the next counterpart to him 
might be his counterpart sure. arrive here two thousand sure. years later. Sure. Hmm. Sure. You can see that the counterpart in heaven identifies with the counterpart on earth. I am. Well, this guy is, you know, he's at the, around the throne. What do you mean? I am. It's like he's actually, you know, fellowshipping with John right. on earth because he's identifying with his counterpart right. on earth. Right. Because yes. he took it to the depth that he took it, he being Paul. Paul's counterpart must be an exponential being, but we are at the end of the of the plan, so we have a potential to be above in stature. Sure. The Patoticus or the the counterpart of Paul. Sure. The father engineered it so that the majority of the Prototokas would incarnate in one generation at the end of the plan. That's Prototokas. Okay.